Not long ago, someone brought me a dresser with sticky drawers. I mean, really sticky. You could hardly get them open. He wanted to use my belt sander to grind the sides of the drawers down so they wouldn't be so tight. I thought about it for a minute, and then I imagined the cloud of choking dust that it would make, and I handed him a plane instead. He looked at me like I was crazy. He was a weekend woodworker, familiar with all the essential tools like sandpaper and sanding belts and power sanders. Why would he use a hand plane when he could use power? So we came over to this bench, and in under five minutes, I had all four drawers gliding as smoothly as they did when they were new. There was no dust in the air, we didn't need masks or earplugs, and the only mess was some easy to sweep up shavings. I used two hand planes for the job, but more important than the planes themselves were the cambered edges on the iron. To remove the bulk of the wood, I used a Stanley No. 5 jack plane with an 8-inch radius on the iron. That left a slightly rippled surface, which I cleaned up with a few strokes from a No. 4 smoothing plane with a very slightly cambered edge. A camber is just an old English word for a radius. Today I'll explain how you can create and use this technique to save time and create less mess, even if you prefer power tools for most other tasks. Let's start with the jack plane. This is not just a woodworker's tool, it's an everyone tool. Up until the latter half of the 1900s, everyone had one of these in their toolbox. Builders, plumbers, handymen, and DIYers, they called it the jack plane for a reason. It was the jack of all trades. You could fix sticky drawers, as I did. You could fit a door in an old house. You could turn a chunk of 2x4 into a chunk of 2x3 without a table saw. Jack planes are capable of rough work, because they have a wide open mouth, and they typically have a cambered iron that can scoop out the shavings like a spoon without the corners of the iron digging into the wood and splintering the fibers. The radius of the iron depends on the work. The greater the curve, the more aggressive the cut you can take. For all but the most aggressive tasks, I like an 8 inch radius. First, I'll show you how to grind the camber on the iron for the first time. Then I'll show you how to maintain it through sharpening. I rip a thin scrap of wood to the same width as the plain iron, and I draw a line down the center. Then I set a compass to about 8 inches, and I strike the curve near the end of the wood blank. I cut close to my line, and then I refine the curve with a sander. Finally, I cut off the excess length, and I label my patterns. I made one for my Stanley number no. 5, and another one for the narrower iron in my Stanley number no. 5 and a quarter. Save these patterns because you'll occasionally want to regrind the radius if it changes over many sharpenings. It pays to have a good, large, sturdy tool rest on your grinder. I have the Kodiak system from woodturnerswonders.com. It is the best one out there, in my opinion. But the full setup is made for wood turners. But they also sell a standalone tool rest that doesn't require the whole system. You can do this grinding with a little tool rest or whatever came on your grinder, but I highly recommend a large tool rest for all tool grinding tasks because all of that steel serves as a heat sink to help keep the tool cool as you work. I'll start with the rest at 90 degrees because I'm going to shape the curve before I grind the bevel. I'm working on one side at a time, beginning each pass in the center and turning the iron toward the corner. After the bulk of the steel is gone, I refine the curve as best I can with even sweeping arcs. You don't need absolute perfection, just try to get the curve reasonably even. I'm using a CBN wheel, which along with a large tool rest does an excellent job at keeping my steel cool. If you're using a regular grinding wheel, you should take very light passes and dip in water frequently. If you turn your steel blue, it won't hold an edge well. Notice the flat facet I created on the cutting edge. It's thinner in the center, and it gets wider toward the corners. You'll use that to your advantage when you grind the bevel. With the tool rest set at about 25 degrees, I can now begin freehanding the bevel. This is done much like the 90 degree grinding was, beginning each pass by lightly touching the center of the iron to the wheel and rotating to one corner, working on one side, then the other. Stop frequently and check the shape of that blunt edge you previously created. The goal is to turn that facet that was once wider at the corners of the iron into an, one of even width all the way across the edge. If one side is narrowing more quickly than the other, take a few extra light passes on the thicker side and so on. You'll obviously do the least amount of grinding at the center where that flat is narrowest. You aren't trying to completely grind away the blunt edge. You want to leave a tiny hair's width of that facet that runs from corner to corner. If you grind it all away, the cutting edge will be so thin that the grinder will easily overheat it. 
Here's what can happen if you get too aggressive with your passes or you grind the edge too thin. That part of the steel has lost its temper and it won't hold an edge well anymore. Because it's only on the corner, I won't bother grinding it all away. But if you blew too much of the edge, you'll be in trouble. Light passes, especially in the center, are critical. And don't forget the water if you're working with a standard grinding wheel rather than a CBN wheel. When you finish, take your iron to your bench stones and install it in your guide. These inexpensive single wheel guides work well for heavily cambered irons because you can rock it as you move across the stone. I begin with a thousand grit. Press down on the right corner of the iron at the beginning of the stroke and then shift the pressure across to the other corner as you pull the guide towards you. Take another stroke, this time beginning with the pressure on the left corner and shifting to the right. Repeat the process, going back and forth from corner to corner until the last of the blunt edge is gone and you can feel a burr all the way across the back of the bevel. Remove that burr with some light rubbing flat on the stone and you're all done. A heavily cambered iron like this in a jack plane is not meant to leave an ultra-fine surface, so I really don't see a need to go beyond a thousand grit. When it dulls, you'll return to your stone. You shouldn't have to return to the grinder unless you chip the iron or you significantly change the camber over many, many sharpenings. That's how to prepare a cambered iron for a hard-working jack plane. It'll scoop out wood quickly, but the surface left behind will be rough and rippled from the shape of the iron. That's perfectly fine for rough work, but other surfaces should be refined with a smoothing plane. Smoothing planes are only slightly cambered. In fact, you may not even call a smoothing plane cambered at all. You're really just easing the corners slightly so they don't dig in and leave lines in the wood. Since the radius shape is very slight, you don't need to grind it. Simply sharpen your edge on a stone with even strokes, either with a honing guide or freehand. But before you finish with each grit, take a few extra passes while pressing down on one corner or the other. You may not be able to notice the slight radius that this creates, but the effect will be that each plane stroke will blend into the last, creating a smooth, even surface without the annoying lines that come from sharp corners. Not every woodworker likes to use hand planes. I don't expect you to assemble a whole collection, but these two planes, the number five jack and the number four smoother with properly cambered irons will save you loads of dusty work and a great deal of time. For more videos about plane sharpening and use, check out the links below this video. See you next time. Some folks are a pleasure to work with, like Ken Rizzo over at woodturnerswonders.com. That's where I get my turning stuff, like sanding supplies and CBN wheels for my grinder. Seriously, if you haven't seen what CBN wheels can do for you, you are missing out. I'll put a link below this video. Use it and tell Ken I sent you. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nub's Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.